All right, we've got the webinar being recorded. Hopefully, uh, this is actually happening. I suppose. Well, the participant count is going up. That means, yes, people are coming. Okay, so we're idiots. Obviously, Gary isn't here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, good, good to see you guys. Um, hopefully, this is actually working uh, as people are able to join. Uh, normally, we see this little thing that says, um, Hey, you're in practice mode. Are you ready to go live? And this time around, it uh, just said resume recording. So we hope we did this right. If we shut everybody out, anybody out, you're, you're listening to this later because you were not able to get in. Uh, Jack and I apologize in advance because this is going to be like really the most amazing thing ever. Because it's just me and Jack. I'm just kidding. Um, anywho, uh, so for this week, you know, we're going to keep up with the theme of um, recession proofing your business, but the focus is going to be um, more on, you know, still your balance sheet and PL, but a little bit, we're going to put the spotlight more on Jack and focus more on what are, you know, some of the legal moves that you ought to be considering, you know, both, ba both based on a combination of best practices. And then also just, you know, our, our collective experience having been through this rodeo before in 07, 08, 09, or, you know, who have do 10, like however long, you know, things actually lasted the, uh, the first time around. So I've got a couple questions that I'm going to see the pot with for Jack. And then, you know, obviously if anybody else has any questions uh, that they want to chime in, you guys know the drill. Um, just hit us up in the uh, chat if you're going to harass us, uh, QA, if you uh, want to, um, yeah, Jamie just told me that she's recording. I, thank you, Jamie, for babysitting me there. That was the person who got this whole thing started. Um, hit us up with the Q&A if you've got an actual question. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, happenings, you know, for the week, uh, I will, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm a political, I'm, I'm a political junkie. So I've just been like focused on the January 6th hearings, but in terms of, and you know, whole what's going on with Roe v. Wade and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm not going to get into that, obviously, otherwise Jack would kill me. But, you know, from that standpoint, you know, I think probably the, the, the biggest thing here, you know, for this call as it relates to being a business owner in finance is, you know, Democrats are, you know, going to try to take one, one, you know, not knowing the full details of the package, are going to probably try to take one shot on the goal <laughs> and a budget, budget, budget reconciliation process to get some things through that they want to get through. Um, you know, kind of the, the other thing that's been working, if you hear about the Mitch McConnell threat, is that they've, there's been a bipartisan agreement on the, um, on some, on some um, concepts associated with foreign trade and specifically China, like it's, something's passed the Senate, something's passed the House. You know, now it's in, that itself is in reconciliation. Um, but Mitch McConnell basically has said, look, I actually pulled the, negotiator, pulled the negotiators off the table and said, no more. If you guys are going to go through this budget reconciliation um, process for some other, you know, social spending programs, you know, some, you know, kind of version of the Build Back Better um, bill. And, you know, the, who knows what's going to happen with that. But, you know, in theory, something, you know, could be coming either pre -mid, I mean, it'd have to come pre mid terms, but something could be coming, you know, on that front um, coming down the wire. So that's what I got for my, uh, my kickoff. How about you, Jack? Well, good morning. Um, so the background, because we kind of talked about, you know, we're going to go back to, uh, is it retro, go back to the 07, 08 kind of period of time in our discussion. So I have, uh, all right, so I found that background and um, just kind of current events. Um, one really interesting current event is that they back. I'm not uptown. I'm actually at my house, but they evacuated our building uptown and several buildings uptown because there's a natural gas smell that they can't figure out, but apparently is permeating everywhere. Wouldn't be surprised. I mean, things like that happen uptown uh, more often than they should. 
with um, construction and things going on, you would think that they would know where things are, but they just plow right through them, whether it's water, sewer, or gas. So um, <clears throat> our staff gets to go home. They were asked to bring their laptops with them, so we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> kind of, you know, I think people are focused on uh, various things that are going on in politics and going on in Washington, whether it is, you know, um, with uh, Roe versus Wade, whether it is with the um, presidential hearings uh, and other stuff. And then, um, you know, the president was over in uh, across, across the pond. And I think he had uh, a press, um, press event earlier this morning, but I haven't seen anything about that or I haven't viewed it. So really kind of a, a, a calm week in the, in the scheme of things. Um, don't have much to report on current events, which is unusual. But you know, it's like me. It's one of those. Eh. Oh, oh, here's oh, here's the clip clave a moment. <clears throat> I'm listening to um, the book Give and Take, uh, and I think you guys had mentioned that on the the webcast previously. And so I'm listening to it because you can listen to it on like 1.4, 1.5 x, and you can still understand what's what's being said. Um, and they were talking about the origin, the where the um, this the term meh was sourced from and, and from the Simpsons, which I didn't realize that that's where it came from. So uh, that's the interesting fact that the term meh came from uh, the Simpsons, if you didn't know that. I'm sure you did, Adam, but you know, yeah. for everyone else. Love me some Simpsons. All right. Um, so anyway, diving into um, just making sure that we're ready um, if something happens. And again, it, you know, just a, just a reminder, you know, I find if I keep on saying it, I, I um, realize that, like, it just, you know, that maybe the absurdity of this as a strategy will um, sink in with me. But in theory, I raise interest rates, that encourages me, you know, I raise interest rate, that encourages the U.S. consumer to um, stop buying stuff. Um, that allows prices to come down because now there's a little bit more supply basic economics. Um, and I'm supposed to do that in a way that reduces inflation, but doesn't uh, cause us to go into a recession um, because I stalled the growth rate too much. I, <laughs> oh no, that just seems ridiculously freaking hard. You know, like it, it, it kind of, it kind of feels like one of those, well, that worked really great in a lab experiment with the mice and the maze, but it doesn't really work real well in the real world. But, you know, who knows? Um, sorry, who knows what's going to happen? But the problem is they're doing it. So the chances are that there's a good chance maybe we will go into a recession. But anyway, um, we wanted to hit more on some of the legal aspects um, this time around just based on our experiences. And you know, we've got some general themes, you know, Jack, that'd be great if you could address. You know, but but the, but the first one, you know, that I think, you know, would, would be helpful to kind of hear about, you know, just based on um, my experience is that in the first recession, you know, we had clients that 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 had, you know, two problems, <laughs> you know, problem number one was on the employee side, you know, there were promises made, you know. Hey, you're an owner, not documented. <laughs> you know, you're an owner, not clearly documented, even though there was some documentation. You know, this old agreement that we signed, you know, 20 years ago that we both agreed was probably not relevant anymore, but it still exists. And nobody cared until it's time to part company. <laughs> then suddenly we really care. And all, pa all past conversations are null and void. And we're going the four corners of the document route. <laughs> um, that that was kind of path number one. You know, path number two is, you know, man, we really want to keep on going. Um, you know, Jack and I are partners. Um, you know, Jack, I think we need to lay off, you know, 10 people. Jack says, that's freaking crazy. You know how hard it would be to replace them. This thing's only going to be temporary. I think we need to just suck it up and not pay ourselves. Well, I can't go without a paycheck. You know, 
okay, well, I'm going to then loan the company money and it will need to be paid back or I'm going to loan the company money. Therefore, now I own more of it. What does the operating agreement say? I don't know. It's pretty sloppy. <laughs> you know, now we're in dispute in party company. Um, so could you kind of address, you know, those general types of issues in terms of what you'd see and what you'd recommend, you know, at this stage in the game for people, um, Jack? Sure. So two opening comments or concepts. One is um, if it's not in writing, then it you need to kind of move as if it doesn't doesn't exist. And kind of a subset of that is words matter. Words that are on the page or words that should have been on the page that are not that will change the interpretation. And I'm talking, including minutia as to where is that comma? Where does that sub phrase go with the entire sentence? Is it modifying what's in front of it, behind it, for the entire paragraph, the entire sentence, what it may be? And so, um, and, and I guess a third is, and the reason why we don't see a whole lot of corporations legal corporations being formed. I'm not talking about tax treatment. I'm talking about legal corporations versus LLCs it is because, and, and I've, we've talked about this before, so it's a little bit um, kind of going back to a discussion that we had more in depth previously with kind of choice of entity and other things is that um, corporations under the North Carolina Corporations Act and most similar acts. Well, let me take a step back. Corporate law and LLC law, there is a model law that has been developed. And that's why you see a pattern many times in corporate law and LLC law in various states because uh, it's easy to ad adopt something rather than write it from scratch. And so, uh, you know, smarter people than me come together occasionally and put this stuff together. The most recent in North Carolina was I think in 2014 for the Limited Liability Company Act. And I've mentioned this before, and I'm gonna again embarrass uh, one of my partners, Warren Keene, who was the chair of that committee who uh, rewrote the LLC Act in North Carolina. Uh, what that means really is, is that as the chair, he did most of the work because you know committee members tend to allow the chair to do stuff. I shouldn't say allow, they look to the chair to do stuff um, and, and participate. And I don't know if that was the case or not. I'm just kind of making that up because I'm very proud that he was the one who did it and that he sits two doors down from me in my office uptown. And so um, the reason why I say that is I, I'm speaking from a position of being on the inside of things when I say that the Limited Liability Company Act in North Carolina when it says that uh, except as otherwise provided in the operating agreement, X, Y, Z, it means that. It is meant to be filler for breaks versus and in comparison to the Corporations Act, which is really geared towards uh, mandatory, potentially mandatory requirements. It's less gap filling, but saying this, these are things that you have to do. So that's a long winded way of saying that in the LLC world via the operating agreement, you have more freedom of contract. That brings you to then the next step in the analysis, which is that um, if you have freedom of contract and you can put whatever you want in an operating agreement, so long as it's not illegal and or, and or against public policy, and that's a very broad statement, um, it's, but generally speaking, then you, know, you, you have arbitrators, mediators, judges, juries, lawyers, looking to that document as to what it says or what it doesn't say. And so when you get into, um, well, this is what we meant, or this is what should have been done, or this is what it says, uh, um, you, you have many times a, an incongruity because the business has evolved, the owners have evolved, the employees have evolved, but the documentation necessarily hasn't. It stayed stagnant. So it says what it said back in 1992 when the four fraternity brothers got together 
and put this piece of paper together because some lawyers said that they had to and they didn't really read it. Fast forward a couple of decades later, and this is a true story, um, actually many true stories that are like this with different people and different circumstances, but fast forward, very successful business, multi-division, um, multi-service lines and product lines. And one of the four, they have a falling out with one of the four. And it is, um, well, what do we do? Well, let's see what the governance documents say. And then it is, oh crap, are you saying that we have to pay that to that person who has basically lost us millions of dollars over the course of time, more, more specifically in the past several years, but yet we've been paying uh, everything for him. We've been paying for his business trips, for his entire family, um, first class to Vegas every year, paying company car, paying health, all these things. And so, uh, and the answer is yes. So it does make a difference. And, you know, Adam had mentioned, well, what about, well, you have employees who were promised certain things uh, and, you know, two scenarios. One is that it's in writing and then you have something catastrophic happen like a recession or something like a recession. And then what do you do? And so you look to the documents. Now there is this equitable concept of impossibility or frustration of purpose. And that is that, okay, well, you know, what are the original intentions and can the contract be enforced as written under the circumstances? That is not a get out of purgatory of what it says in the document at all. That is just a practical approach to, is it possible to even enforce this? Is it practical even to enforce it? A lot of times it is, yeah, the words say what they say, but at the end of the day, what are you going to get if you win? And so you get into all those issues and considerations. Um, promises as between owners. And um, an example of that would be is, is that it says that upon uh, six months notice, the, any uh, one of the owners has a put option. So what that means essentially is that they can say, you need to buy out my ownership. And a lot of times it has the terms, whether it's a you know, do evaluation um, what, and the formula is there in the document, but there's no way that that can happen. Like maybe it says 50% cash and 50% on a three year or five year note paid monthly with interest at whatever the, the federal um, APR rate is for medium term or long term promissory notes or debt. So you have those kind of things. And, and so, you know, it's, I go back to, it's easy to say everything needs to be in writing and anticipate everything and put it down. And if you never use it, that's great. I mean, that's the academic answer. The reality is, is that um, the business is organic hopefully it is growing and you you can't forget about those documents that were drafted a couple of decades ago in a drawer somewhere that are probably on uh you know in courier font with yellow and the paper is turned yellow uh and that you know you need to look constantly look at those things and so when you are doing things on an annual basis and business owners should be doing this and and i'm not trying to to pick on any business owners who don't do it but you know i would think that uh hopefully people on this that have been listening to us um you know ha have been uh, proactive in their business because we've been advocates of doing that since uh, we started this program many many weeks ago is to um, really take a look at, you know, open up that file cabinet every once in a while and look in it and see what's in there. And you might be surprised uh, what has happened um, and what has not been documented. Another example is, is that the owners at some point in the, the evolution of a business transferred their assets to trusts. Well, that never made its way. It, it was in their estate plan documents, but didn't make it, its way into the legal documents. So now when there is a transfer of the business, in particular, a transfer of land that has the LLC 
actually at that point it, it was a, a, a corporation it should have been an LLC but um, and who is going to sign on behalf of the seller well there are four five six trusts and who has the authority well the trustee of each trust has the authority to authorize someone of the seller to sell the real estate. And unfortunately, this all was found out kind of later on in the um, due diligence process because we were asking for documentation. Um, we finally just said, we're going to just go look at it ourselves and had a, a paralegal go look at the, the chain of title. And we found some indications, like we found some real estate that had been transferred properly or had the trust name and then we're like, wait a minute, what is going on with this? Because it would be unusual that some assets remained outside of the trust and some remained in the trust when those assets existed at the same, you know, at the time that it, some things were transferred to trust. There may be reasons for doing that. So, um, but it's just the, the, the documentation um, was not handled, not attended to properly. And so now you have cleanup issues. So, and we were talking about last week and in prior weeks about what you can do with respect to your business and getting it shinier is to look at those things. And a lot of times that doesn't happen until there is a, a, an event, whether it's a refinance, a sell, a, a, one of the owners is being bought out or kicked out, um, you know, whatever it may be. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, Adam, about kind of the things that we see on maybe an owner level of uh, some um, things that can be fixed in anticipation of good and bad times. Yeah, and it's kind of it, it's kind of tough because it um you know there can be a lot of emotion tied to yeah it'd be it'd be sort of like if I went and said hey I you know been married for twenty two years but I'd like to start talking about putting a prenup in place <laughs> you know? so it uh you know it's it's one of those things where it's like you need to do it but you need to tread lightly and you know we always say. You know, business is like a marriage, um, you know, in some ways, well, you know, it is and it isn't, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it really is a business contract. Um, and, and you have a respon fiduciary responsibility to each other to make sure that the business contract is as clear as possible, <laughs> you know, in, in the areas that it's vague. So I think if you, I think if you approach it from that standpoint, you know, and just accept the fact you may have an emotional partner that you're talking to. <laughs> what do you mean we're going to crack open the operating room and take a look at the bias health provision? You think about something that I don't know about? It? It's like you just are going to have to figure out how to get through those, um, that kind of head trash to say, no, look, it's just in our best, it's in our mutual best interest, you know, to do this one time just to make sure it's, you know, crystal clear and out of the way. As painful as it is, I mean, I, I think Jack and I both would say that the clients we have that avoid that have avoided, like I've never seen someone who avoided the issue have it have that experiment turn out well. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> like it's always I'm going to avoid the issue until I can't avoid the issue anymore because something happened. And then I go back and say, really should not have avoided that issue <laughs> way back. <laughs> And, and you, you, you glossed over this a moment ago, but it's, it's when it is, um, you know, when things are good and, you know, things are not adversarial. And we've seen, you and I and others have seen where, and, and I mentioned the four fraternity brothers, you know, way back when, and you can imagine, you know, the being on top of the world, coming out of college and starting a business together, uh, you know, being the best of buddies. And then something happens or something happens um, within the family organization, or if the family unit uh, and, and things don't go as smoothly with the relationships. And, um, you know, the other thing too is, and I understand this very well in that it's just human nature to deal with issues and then say, well, we'll properly document that later. And that becomes problematic. And I give you a, a recent example, which is that a uh, departing owner says, okay, I'm out. I'm giving you my notice. 
I don't want to be part of any of the meetings anymore. Um, obviously, he felt comfortable that there, and there was a formula in the operating agreement and in his employment agreement dealing with what happens if any of, if he leaves the employment of, and this is a medical practice. And, um, but during COVID, they said, he said, I'm out and um, I don't want to, you know, they invited him to meetings for a couple of times and they said, no, I don't want to go. So they stopped inviting him. And it was, uh, it came down to, well, you guys did stuff in meetings that I didn't approve. Well, you didn't ask to be a participant of that meeting. Um, you know, the better way would have been to document. I mean, and there was an email, one email that said, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but there should have been, and, and obviously it's easier to do it in hindsight, say, yeah, there should have been. But, um, you know, learn from those kind of mistakes and, and it became contentious. It is, well, you made decisions with respect to our compensation uh, and um, which impacted me and impacted all of the owners and all of the employees um, and, and fairly, not inequitably, meaning that it was an across the board kind of thing on the owner level and on the employee level. And yet there was this issue as to, uh, you know, the operating agreement provided for notice. It provided that as long as he was an owner, he was entitled to participate. So there should have been something more. And, and you know, they thought that having an email that said, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to come to the boring meetings anymore and deal with uh, company policy issues and employee issues because I know I'm going to be out sometime down the road. It came back to bite them. So it's it's those kind of things that um, you know at the time that he said I'm out and it was done pursuant to uh, I just. Um, don't want to be, and it wasn't, it was um, friendly. It was a friendly, initially started out as a friendly divorce, right? And it was like, hey, I want to go and pursue these other interests. And I just, you know, don't want to see patients every day and, you know, had all kinds of reasons, but then it became, it became contentious. And then it was, all right, this is what the operating agreement says. Yeah, I sent you an email, but I didn't mean that, you know, for every meeting, I just meant that I just want to deal with the mundane stuff but changing compensation is not mundane. It's pretty significant. So again, see it on both sides, but everybody thought at that time that it was okay because they weren't at odds with each other. And so I, you know, I think we're trained to be suspicious about things and try to anticipate things like that. But, you know, when you're with someone who you've known for a while or even a family member or a close friend, whatever it may be, and you're going into business with each other, it is difficult, as Adam said, to think about all the bad things that might happen. Um, it is also kind of um, when you have, and, and that's just, that is on a kind of horizontal. When you start talking about vertical, I mean, you know, grandfather, father, son, for example, that becomes even more difficult because then you start talking about mortality issues. Well, you know, when you die, this is what's gonna happen. I mean, those are not fun conversations to have, but should be. I mean, it's okay. Or, or what happens if, another example, um, uh, family business, the one of the children, so you have parent, children, uh, adult children, divorce, potential remarriage. Um, the current owners, the family, the siblings, the, the other siblings and the parents are like, Yes, you're going to have her sign a prenup. And I mean, imagine, and, and it was jokingly said, well, just tell them that we require that, that it's not you, it's us. I'm like, that's, that's not going to work. I mean, you're basically saying, hey, I want to spend the rest of my life with you and, and my family loves you, but they want you to sign a prenup. Okay, that's just, that is inconsistent. I mean, from a business perspective, it is totally consistent from a personal and interpersonal relationship, new relationship, trusted, hey, new daughter-in-law, welcome to the family kind of thing. Um, and, and I've seen you know, in that scenario, the brother, the, the new brother-in-law or the sister-in-law, they understand it's business and they're fine. They're, they're offended, but they understand it's business. And others, it, it puts a really big strain 
on the, and the marriage hasn't even happened yet. So it's those kind of things you need to think about. And, and we get it. We understand that it's a, a difficult conversations to have, but you know, and, and we're used as a, a tool to help um, remediate some of that pain. And we're the messengers to say, well, you know, this is just what needs to be done because imagine, okay, maybe it's not your spouse, but it is, you know, your brother's spouse that goes off the deep end. And now um, something happens to your brother and she's now an owner in the company. Um, are you okay with that? Do, do you love, do you like her that much? You already know you don't like her. So again, I'm just going way past kind of uh, into the weeds as far as examples go. But that's, that's those are the kind of things you need to anticipate. And they are difficult conversations to have, but they will be um, exponentially difficult when an event occurs and you would have wished that you had those provisions in place. I appreciate that, Jack. Um, and I feel like we're probably going to have some more to get to in the next webinar. Um, but, you know, another one that I'd like to hit on, if we switch gears over to the balance sheet for a minute, you know, um, you know, man, things are going, you know, pretty bad, but thank God I've got, you know, that line of credit um, to keep me going. Um, woo. Okay, let me fill out this renewal paperwork. What? <laughs> You're not renewing? <laughs> I need to find a new home? <laughs> what? You're reducing? <laughs> What? You're freezing at the existing balance? <laughs> um, you know, what? You're asking for a curtailment payment? <laughs> you know, yeah, that, you that was a shocker. Through? Yeah, absolutely. That was a shocker to a lot of people. And, and I admit, you know, at, at that time, I, well, I don't know if we had a home equity line, but I know I didn't read it very carefully. It was like, okay, um, having a plenty of equity in the house. I'm not asking for a huge line. Um, we weren't intending on drawing on it. Uh, and it was just kind of like a, a, a um, surrogate to uh, some actually having more cash in an emergency fund. Um, and so, but there were a lot of people that were caught off guard and they're like, oh yeah. And they, they had a, 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 I should say, what turned out to be a false sense of security, but at the time was a legitimate sense of security that, okay, I have this to fall back on. And then those that had drawn on the line of credit, uh, and, and obviously I'm talking about personal line of credit versus a business line of credit. Usually you, most businesses don't have a line of credit that's at zero. I mean, they usually get it for some reason and they utilize it. Um, so assuming that we're talking about business line of credit, that it's, yeah, uh, what do you mean you're not renewing it? I mean, I think people thought that it was their option, the business owner's option to renew it and that it was gonna continue on moving forward and forward. And the, also the, the misassumption was what the caps were or maybe not aware of what the potential caps were on the increase in rate because maybe there was a steady rate, maybe the rate stayed pretty, stable or maybe just a little tick up maybe for lucky a little tick down at some point but um you know the jump up in rates you know adam was talking about okay you know what's going to happen in order to try to slow down inflation and so are we you know going to be a, a new set of people surprised that when we get those letters or those denials that um yeah we're not going to increase your line you, we, we thank you so much for your business. You have been a wonderful customer. You have paid and never defaulted on any of the terms and conditions of your um, business equity line. Uh, you've paid your term note uh, very um, you know, on time. We haven't had to ask you for anything, but yeah, we're not going to renew. Or, and this is probably similarly as, as closely harmful or hurtful is that, yeah, um, we're going to take a look at your financials and we have higher requirements now. And even if you were to correlate a, a normal increase like inflationary dollars, as far as what maybe a, a, the, the base loan base is, or, you know, loan to equity ratio, all those things that the standards are higher, meaning more requirements. 
And it's like, well, wait a minute, this was good before. And it, and it should be the opposite in that you, we are in a trusted relationship because we've done, we, we've been on our best behavior with respect to this loan. So why are you hitting us up with this? And um, I know we have potentially some bankers on the line, nothing against bankers because it's not the bankers that are doing this. It is the banks that are saying, this is what we need to do. They have done an assessment of their credit risk in the current environment looking at their overall portfolios and reassessing the risk and saying, okay, this is how much risk, new risk we're willing to throw out there. And so those variables change over the course of time. And so that, that was a, a real big hit that, yeah, you know, the availability and sources of credit in time of crisis dried up pretty quickly. And then I would say, did not go back to where it was before. This heightened scrutiny, maybe not as high as it was you know, during this period of time, but then you have also, and this is you know, not any one of our faults unless you were in the mortgage industry and you committed fraud and did all those bad things that appraisers and everyone else did to cause overinflated prices that were then paid by, you know, put mortgages in place and they were defaulted. And then we had that whole period of time in like 2010, where you have half built houses, you have banks that are owning a lot more real estate than they wanted, uh, both residential, commercial and all those things. But, um, you know, because of that happening, then you have more strict rules, which is natural consequence. Um, you know, when the whole Enron thing happened, well, okay, you have more strict uh, requirements, regulations on um, auditors, on CPA firms, right? And so, uh, and legal requirements too, as far as when we do certain reporting, um, we have uh, certain requirements that we need to follow in order to be able to produce that audit letter to the CPAs who are doing the overall audit to be able to produce the financials and the audited financials, and especially with publicly traded companies. So um, yeah, that, that was a real difficult time and a surprise to a lot of people. And so, um, you know, I guess the, the, the lesson learned is review those terms and conditions, all that legalese junk that you don't want to at least know where the variables are and what your maximum exposure is. Maybe not read every single word on the sheet on, in the loan documents, but know where the limits are and where those things can be adjusted and make sure that that is within your tolerance yeah. um, to be able to, to deal with business issues. Yeah, it kind of, you know, it, I think my own observation having been, been with this, and I'd you know, love to hear if you have an example of this, but I Generally, if I was in this position, then, you know, my decision tree would be something like, hey, I'm counting on the line of credit to carry me through and the cash availability balance associated with it. If I just renewed, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> you know, if I'm six months out from renewal, I'm feeling, you know, good. If I am up for renewal or renewal is coming up pretty imminently, Yes, I'm dog sitting, by the way. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I just, I need to start having a dialogue around, all right, let's make sure this renewal is actually going to happen. You know, all systems are go with that. Um, you know, in, independent of that, you know, regardless of where I'm at in the renewal phase, you know, I feel like it would, you know, it's a, it's a best practice to say, look, I mean, a bank probably isn't going to, ride with you for a while if you've got negative even though <laughs> you know you know at best you got one year of that you know so you kind of need to go back to one of the things we discussed when analyzing you know your overall financial health which is like you need it you need to you need to be generating enough EBITDA at least to have your line of credit balance paid down if it were fully maxed, even if it wasn't fully maxed, within probably a five-year time period. So you just run a little loan amortization schedule, run it out for five years, 
you know, as if it was a term debt five years. So, if I, so for example, if I had a million dollar line of credit, um, even if I had zero balance on it, you know, I would, to be in the safe zone, I probably need to have about 300 grand in EBITDA to be in the safe zone of that line of credit staying intact. If I'm not, if, if, if I'm not then the way the bank's going to look at that is that, hey, that's really interesting. If this son of a bitch maxes the thing out, we're screwed and never going to get paid back because he's not making any money. <laughs> Don't even know he's going to be here anymore. So you just, you got to go back, you got to default back to, you know, I love all our banking partners at the same time. They had a rough time during the recession. So their default position is Jack's probably going to screw me. Let's just think about how he's going to screw me and make sure, make sure I know. Because a lot of people did screw the banks with, with little asset shift shenanigans, you know, misleading loan documents, you know, all sorts of shell games and nefarious dishonesty to try to get out of having to pay their debts that they racked up, they shouldn't have racked up and knew better. Um, so I just, you know, that kind of gives you like a, when you're doing your, you know, scenario planning, that kind of gives you a target to aim for. It's like, look, I mean, independent of the cash flow and all that kind of stuff, it's like, you know, you kind of have a minimum floor you probably need to be targeting to if you have a banking relationship that you were counting on. You know, that, that some function of what if you maxed out the line of credit and had to pay it back in a period of time that 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 those principal payments for a year prob times 1.25 or 1.5, probably round numbers of what your EBIT needs to needs to be showing up as <laughs> um, as a minimum floor to keep that balance intact. Yeah, and I see a use and some may say a misuse I, and, and taking a revolving line of credit and taking it uh, from this perspective. Oh, great, I'm gonna tap into that. I'm gonna use the funds, but they, they use the funds as a, a replenishment of working capital on a semi-permanent basis with the perspective that, well, we don't have to deal, we have an infusion of cash that we don't have to deal with. Yeah, we'll service the debt, but if, if, if you are just paying interest, then uh, we'll deal with it at the time of exit, whether it's a sale of the company or maybe we'll refinance that into term debt or into a, a different uh, a different product or different revolver when the term comes or we'll renew it, whatever it may be. And I think that's a very dangerous perspective to or position to take, which is I think a kind of a, a misuse of, you're basically um, turning a, a revolver into kind of a term loan essentially, um, which is, what you want to do essentially from a perspective, but you want to, the problem is, is that you say, all right, it's a term loan. I should be paying back principal, but you don't pay back the principal and you just keep it, you know, spinning, spinning, spinning. And then when you do pay it down, it's like, oh, I have some, you know, the, the $500,000 or a million dollars that becomes zero, you know, it's like a reset. And then it's like, you get below the million dollars it's like, oh, I have fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars that I can go spend. Get it back up to zero, which is really a million dollars. So I think there's danger in um, kind of taking that perspective with your revolver, yeah, or your line of credit. Yeah. So you know, as we kind of wrap up here, as we're bumping up against the noon hour, Jack, you know, keep keep sticking on the balance sheet and moving more towards you know real estate. You know, what do you, what do you see there in terms of just, you know, making sure you're um, defended against, you know, a, a significant valuation reduction, you know, or, or, some, or something like that, that could cause a severe cash drain. If, if, I, if the bank said, hey, that's really interesting, your property's got down in value, we need some money. Yeah, I, I think that, well, there's a couple things that can be done on the front end of things that you would think are normal course. And, and a lot of times it is normal and sometimes required by a lender or by a title company, but it's not doing sufficient due diligence. Like, okay, you do um, a phase one and you're like, yeah, okay. Or, you know, it, it, but, or not knowing more about the investment. 
Um, I have a client who has some land out in, uh, in South End, and it's, in the it's been in the family for a while. And he, he told me what his, his grandfather paid for it and what its value is now. I'm like, okay, that was awesome. Um, the uh, other side of that spectrum was land that was bought um, potentially in a risky area, but could have been something that would have been fantastic. But for the fact that there was contamination that didn't come uh, literally bubble up uh, and was not caught. Now, if you go back and look at the records, someone probably should have flagged that for further investigation, but it wasn't. And so it's like, all right, well, you, you, you run the risk of that, but you mitigate that by having the environmental surveys done. You mitigate that by having title insurance uh, and having the, all the surveys and everything else done. So, um, yeah, and, and there are those who, um, in, in, in aggregating or collective factor is when then you have various single purpose entities that own pieces of land that are essentially guaranteeing the obligations of maybe an operating company. So there's a certain assumption that that land, meaning the only asset that's owned by the LLC that is the guarantor is the land. So there's a, an evaluation that's done in relation to the loan as the guarantor uh, or as the guarantor that floats back into the loan transaction and the risk assessment. So what happens if that land does increase or decrease in value and then you have, wait a minute, we're under collateralized uh, according to our ratios. And so you need to pony up something else. Or there is a business divorce and part of the divorce is, well, you are gonna take this piece of land as the liquidation of your ownership interest in this entity and that creates a problem. So, uh, you know, and, and again, some of those things are, preventable, I think, but some of the things are just, you know, we're in an inflated real estate market now. And I think I'm, I'm seeing numbers come down, meaning that there's more availability of commercial real estate, residential real estate, uh, maybe because of the rates increasing, it may be because people are scared of recession, so they don't want to put the cash out. Um, it may be that uh, people are not ready and willing and able to, or really ready, willing to jump on real estate uh, and um, are okay with uh, short-term occupancy, meaning the form of rentals. And for a business owner that owns commercial real estate that was office buildings, I mean, the vacancies, in, in particular uptown, where you have people moving. I mean, South End, I was in South End uh, a couple of weeks ago in a particular part of South End, and I was like, wow, this was not here not too long ago in the scheme of things, meaning a couple of years ago, and just the office buildings and they're building these little communities in various places in, in South End. And it's, you know, you park your car, you don't have to walk, the train is right there. And so, um, you know, it's, it's also uh, in part of your research, the people, some, many people who bought along the um, light rail line did the research and, and put it together as to, okay, they either saw people buying and jumped on that train, I guess I shouldn't use that metaphor, but, uh, and, and knew it was coming, or they're like, hmm, I can see how this might stack up appropriately. So they're very entrepreneurial in doing that. Some people just lucked into it. So, you know, doing that research and, and seeing what's there and, how to protect and, and there like i said there's various ways to protect yourself so just knowing what you're getting into on the real estate side because um banks will ask and they will ask those questions as to what's been done hey you're you're in an industrial area or you know this it looks like this is growing in a certain direction um so what have you done to make sure that that piece of real estate is valued as much as you say it is on that balance sheet. Uh, and you know, if, if there is some sort of liability, have you uh, adjusted or um, indicated that as a potential liability for whatever, whatever it may be? Um, 
So anyway, does that answer what you're looking yeah. for? Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, we'll wrap it up on the noon hour. Um, so we've hit you guys up with a lot of legal um, scenarios, but the, you know, they're not like, these are not theoreticals. I mean, this is like stuff that actually happened. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like one of those, if there's such a thing as an avoidable train wreck, you know, that's kind of what, you know, this, this actually is. So, you know, just, we would encourage you guys to heed the advice. And I think, you know, next week we'll hit a little bit more on some profit and loss issues and then, you know, kind of carry forward um, with this and some other themes going forward. But, you know, kind of what I would say is uh, last call for any questions as we start to get wrapped up around here. And, and I will say we did promise a mystery guest and sorry that we, um, the, the people that we had in mind on for, for both uh, Adam and myself were unavailable. And so uh, we didn't, we, we didn't want to um, not meet our expectations and what we wanted to present to all of you. So we uh, did not present, although you had a dog on your lap. So I guess that could count, right? Ah. Yeah, see, there's, there's the mystery guest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> there, we kept our promise. All right. I don't yeah, there you go. M M mystery guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I uh, appreciate the time, Jack, and appreciate the advice. As always, I always think, man, I love hearing this stuff. And then I start scratching my head thinking, oh, crap, that's probably stuff I need to be following myself, you know, in terms of some of this advice. So I appreciate it, Jack. And I will, as always, uh, talk to you next week. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. All right. See ya.